Greetings. Welcome from Mind of Messiah Ministries. This is Sharon Clough. Today, I'm going to share with you a warning that I feel like I've been given from the Lord. So I've called this warning. If it comes from the enemy's camp, it will cost you more than you can imagine. I'm going to talk to you about the life of David out of the book of First Chronicles and how he was tripped up by an item that was beautiful that caused him lots and lots of heartache and his people as well. So we're going to get to that. But first, I want to share with you the setup for this. I know that the scripture tells us that the wealth of the ungodly is laid up for the just. But things that are laid up for us are ultimately to be consecrated for the glory of God. When God blesses us spiritually, financially, and with such great abundance, those things are, are to be used to further the kingdom of God. They're not just so we can consume upon our lust. So in the book of First Chronicles, as I read through that last week, I saw things I'd never seen before. And sometimes we're just not ready to see things, or we don't have understanding of biblical concepts. And then all of a sudden, as we're reading it, we start connecting dots, dots that we've never seen before. So I experienced a connect the dot day last week as I started putting pieces of the puzzle together from what the word was offering as information. So how many of you realize that the Bible gives us what information that we need to know, but it usually doesn't fill in the blank with many details. Some of the Apocrypha or the Dead Sea Scrolls will help with the details if people are willing to take a look at those. But I do realize that not everyone will embrace any historical documents outside of the Bible to complete the details. So as I share with you this warning that I've seen in the Word this week, and I do think it's significant, I'm using only words of the scriptures, and you'll have to see if you see what I see. Please, I would appreciate it if you would leave me comments and let me know if you think I have seen this correctly. I did search to see if I'd seen anyone else teach it. I didn't find that, and so I have seen other things that people taught that I think that they presume to know what happened, but I do think that the scripture and research has proven what I'm sharing with you today. So this is the story of David taking the census of Israel. And because of that census that he took, God sends a plague. 70,000 people end up dying. So I don't know how many times I've read this story before. It is also in 2 Samuel 24. So in the past, this story has just left me thinking, what's so bad about numbering the people? Our government does that on a regular basis. And in America, we've grown up being numbered. We have a number assigned to us at birth. I think if you stay with me, that you're going to see why that's so offensive to God. And you'll begin to see why David even thought about doing it in the first place. Where did that idea come from? I know in the scriptures that God told them to take census when they were going to war, but that was of just the fighting men. And so let's continue to look at that. As I pondered on what I was seeing, I asked the father, what do you want me to share with the body from this? Because I could see this all fitting together and say, yeah, but what's the lesson? What are we supposed to get from this? Well, I, I couldn't quit thinking about all the details of this event. This portion of scripture tells us that the devil calls him by his, who this entity is, the devil stood up against Israel and caused David to number the people. What's the devil got to do with numbering the people? We're going to see that there is an occult, demonic, pagan item involved in this story that isn't easily seen because of the chapter divisions. We have to remember that the Bible was written on scrolls with no vowels and no kind of punctuation at all. There's no chapters, there are no verses. So all the punctuation and the subject separation has been added by the translators. 
if we could read the Hebrew in the original or the Greek in the original and look at these scrolls, we would be able to see, well, did the enemy come in like a flood or did God come in like a flood? Depends upon where the punctuation is. So that's why it's important for us to read the Word of God in context. You read the whole book through and you get the whole picture of what's being said. I think the book of Romans is a perfect example of that. People take things out of Romans and they quote Paul, but they never start from the beginning. When you start from the beginning, you go to the end, you get the whole picture. So let me start here in 1 Chronicles 21. And I hope this is as eye-opening for you as it was for me. So I'm going to start chapter 1, and we're going to go through 17. First Chronicles 21, 1. Satan calls him what his name means, the adversary, stood up against Israel, and he incited David to count the population of Israel. So this is clearly that it's Satan who incites David. He stirs him up to count the people. Why does Satan have the authority to do this with David? David is a man after God's own heart. How can the devil incite David? I'm going to answer that question for you. Before I go further, I have to address the elephant in the room. This story is also told in 2 Samuel 24. And that part of scripture says that it's God who incited David to count the people. Well, remember what I just shared. There are no connecting words in the original text. No vowels or punctuation. So much is left to the translators, and they just tend to follow what the other ones have already translated it. They kind of stay in the same pathway. This is how it reads in the Amplified in 2 Samuel 24.1. Now, again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them to say, go count the people of Israel and Judah. Really? God did that? Well, let me remind you that God tempts no man to sin. We often blame God for what the devil is actually responsible for. And this looks like one of those times. In James 1.13, it says, let no one say when he's tempted that I'm being tempted of God. For temptation does not originate from God, but from our own flaws. For God cannot be tempted by what is evil. And he himself, he tempts no man. Now, if we believe that, we have to go look deeper and see why is there a conflict in what this says. In one part of scripture, it says devil incited David, and the other part, it says that God does. So I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I can use tools available in an attempt to render the original text as accurate as possible. So after searching, I discovered that there are several translations that do not lay this temptation on God, but on the adversary, Satan, exactly where it belongs. So I'm going to read a few of them. 2 Samuel 24, 1, and this is in the Benton Septuagint translation. And the Lord caused his anger to burn forth again in Israel because it had already happened. He'd already been angry once and sent famine. And Satan, now this is right out of the translation, Satan stirred up David against them saying go number Israel and Judah so here we have a second witness we have it in first chronicles now we have it in second Samuel from the Benton Septuagint translation previously God had been angry with Israel and resulted in a famine so the scripture is stating that God would again become angry with Israel we aren't told why God is angry this time. We have to figure that out by looking at the word and seeing what happened. But I think you're going to see that pretty soon. Here's another translation. In the literal standard version. And the anger of Yahweh added to burn against Israel. And an adversary moves David about them saying, go number Israel and Judah. This is the literal standard version. 
it says clearly that the adversary is the one who moved David. This is again out of Samuel. This is the Young's literal translation. And the anger of Jehovah added to burn against Israel. And an adversary moveth David about them, saying, Go number Israel and Judah. So this is what the Benson commentary reads. And again. So he's going to explain that phrase. And again. After the former tokens of his anger, such as the three years of famine mentioned in chapter 21. So that's already mentioned in the same chapter that we're talking about. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel for their sins and on account of the following actions of David. The anger of the Lord, it must be well observed, was not the cause of David's sin, nor the sins of the people, for God cannot be the author of sin, but David's sin and the sins of Israel were the cause of God's anger. So their sin was the cause of God's anger. God did not cause them to sin. So the phrase, and he moved David against them, it says in this commentary, the reader must observe that there is no nominative case before the verb. So, and he moved David against them. No nominative case before the verb. In the original text to express who moved David. Because of this confusion in the translation, we are blessed to have the author of First Chronicles, who has clearly cleared this whole matter up for us. It was not God's nature to tempt David to sin, but clearly the nature of Satan. But how was he able to do that? Well, stay tuned. You're going to find out. The Genevieve Study Bible says, the Lord permitted Satan to stir David up. So with that out of the way, let's continue in First Chronicles. And then I'm going to show you what opened the door for Satan's temptation to affect David's thought life. He's a man after God's own heart. Where did he get this idea that was going to be so offensive to God? First Chronicles 21.2. So David said to Joab, Joab is his general and the leader of his people, go count Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring me the total so that I may know. Well, why? Just because? Just so he will know? This isn't for going to war. This isn't for any other reason. Verse 3, and Joab said, may the Lord, yod heh that's God himself, add to his people, a hundred times as many as there are. But my Lord, the king, are they not all your servants? Why then does my Lord require this? Why will he bring guilt on Israel? Joab's telling him, when you do this, you're bringing guilt on the whole nation. So Joab is asking David, why do you delight in this thing? Why does it bring you pleasure? What, what's the big deal? Why do you want to count the people? So Joab feels that to number the people will bring guilt. And Joab was David's military general. Somehow, he clearly saw this as a sin, and he warned David. But David refused to listen. Why was this sin? Why would it bring guilt on Israel, on a whole nation? Well, we're going to continue verse 4. But the king's word prevailed over Joab. So Joab left and he went throughout of all of Israel. And then he came to Jerusalem. Verse 4. It says that the words of the king prevailed against Joab and his captain. So this is out of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 24, 4, when it talks about this story, it says it wasn't only Joab that tried to talk the king out of this. It was all of his captains, all the captain of the host. No one except David thought that this was a good thing to do. So first Chronicles 21, five, and then Joab gave the total of the census of the people to David. And 
In all of Israel, there was 1,100,000 men that drew the sword. And in Judah, there was 470,000 men who drew the sword. But, but, he did not count Levi or Benjamin among them because the king's order was detestable to Job. The King James Version says it was an abomination, abominable to Job. He loathed what he was being required to do. So there's a real conflict here between the king and his head man. Well, the Levites would naturally not be counted because they were set aside to minister unto God. But Benjamin, which was the smallest tribe that would have been the last to be counted as the youngest son of Jacob, was simply left undone. When David changed his mind and began to repent for his actions, then Job just quit counting. So, 1 Chronicles 21, 7. Now God was displeased with this act of arrogance and pride, and he struck Israel. That's out of the Amplified Version. Now God was displeased with this act of arrogance and pride. Pride always goes before fall. We are told in the Amplified that God sees this counting as arrogance and pride. Verse 8. And then David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I've done this thing. But now I beseech you, take away the wickedness and the guilt of your servant. So he realizes he did bring guilt on himself and on the nation. For I have acted very foolishly. Again, why did he do this? Well, think about this right now. David is not a young man anymore. When this occurs, it's at the end of his life. He's a very old man. What prompted this action? You think he would have lived long enough and been smart enough not to do things that would upset God. So I told you from the beginning that this was a warning about embracing the things of the enemy. So God speaks to David through his seer. And I'm guessing that this man, David, who claimed that every last detail of the temple had been given to him by God, it's all in this First and Second Chronicles, he's able to hear God on every detail on how to make every candlestick and how much it weighs, it, but he can't hear from God himself about the sin he's just committed. Instead, he needs a seer. Verse 9, and the Lord said to Gad, David's seer, go and tell David, saying, thus says the Lord, I offer you three choices. Choose for yourself one of them, which I will do to you as punishment for your sin. So Gad came to David and he said to him, thus says Yahweh, yod heh vav -Hey, choose for yourself. Verse 12. Either three years of famine, mm, they already went through three years of famine. He knows what that's like. Are three months to be swept away before your enemies while the sword of your enemies overtakes you? Or else three days of the sword of the Lord and a plague in the land. And the angel of the Lord bringing destruction throughout all the territory of Israel. Now, therefore, consider what answer. I shall return to him who sent me. Gad says, what am I supposed to tell God? What do you want me to do? What do you want to tell him? Verse 13, and David said to Gad, I'm in a great distress. Please let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercies are very great. But do not let me fall in the hands of man. So the Lord sent the plague on Israel, and 70,000 men fell in Israel. Wow. Wow. Verse 15, God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying it, the Lord looked and he relented concerning the catastrophe. And he said to the destroying angels, so we have all kinds of angels. We have protecting angels and messenger angels. We have destroying angels and judgment angels. God has angels of all different categories. But he says to this destroying angel, it is enough. Now remove your hand of judgment. 
And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Onan, the Jebusite. And then David raised his eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord. So David's eyes are open to see how this destruction is coming. He's standing between the earth and heaven, having drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. And then David and the elders, they were covered in sackcloth and they fell on their faces. Do you think maybe that the elders were seeing this too? If not, David must have said, we're about to see all of Jerusalem destroyed. There's already a plague going on in Israel, and it's initiated by the son of David. Verse 17, and David said to Gad, is it not I who commanded the people to be counted? I'm the one who has sinned and done the evil. But as for these sheep, the people of Israel, what have they done? Oh, Lord, my God, please let your hand be stayed against me and against my father's house, but not against your people, that they should be plagued. Whew. These next verses determine for us the location that the temple, where the temple will be established. So David goes to the threshing floor of Onan, the Jebusite. And he purchases it. That's where the angel's standing. So he's going to go. I mean, this angel's got his sword drawn. And he goes and he purchases it. And he offers up sacrifice. And God answers him by fire. It's this experience that gives David the final push to build the temple that he always wanted to do. So God told David that his son would build the temple. Really, what he told him is, you will have a descendant. He didn't say necessarily it was his son. He doesn't say specifically that it's Solomon. The temple that will be everlasting will be built by Yeshua, Jesus. And he comes forth from the loins of David. Is it really easy to miss the final fulfillment of prophecy when we hear it? We always want it to be fulfilled right now. And so when God says, I'm going to give you a descendant who's going to have an everlasting kingdom, who's going to build the temple that will last forever, and he will have it always be on the throne and have an everlasting kingdom. David just already assumes, well, that's somebody in the next generation. When God is speaking of his son, Yeshua, we want everything to be right now. Even if there's a third temple built in Jerusalem in our day, it will not be the temple that Yeshua built. It will be a temple that will be there to provide a place for the anti-Messiah to sit and claim that he's God. At least that's what the scriptures tell us. Do yourself a favor and read the rest of this chapter. Once God answers David by fire, the angel of the Lord puts his sword back in the sheath and the plague is stopped. Hallelujah. Thank God. Let's look at how David became influenced by the devil. Why did Satan stand up against him? How did he get that authority? We're told to take every thought captive. You and I are, according to the scriptures. David didn't do that, even when other people warned him about it. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing, this was a high thing, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So Israel was to take a census only when ordered by God. It was not to stroke the pride or the ego of the king. In chapter 27 of 1 Chronicles, it says this, the heads of the tribes and the captains are named. And at this time, David is about to die. And he has set everything in order for the building of the temple right down to the measure and the weight of each candlestick. He's not relinquishing control up to his very last decree. In verse 23, it tells us that even though David has taken account of everything, he doesn't count every person because he's learned his lesson chapter 27 23 says but david took not the number of them from 20 years old and under because 
This is why. Because Yahweh, Yohevah, has said he would increase Israel like the stars of the heaven, like the sands of the sea. They're, they're not countable. There's too many of them. And David was trying to count them and be satisfied and stroke his eagle by how many there were. Well, this is what infuriated God. He had promised to make Israel as the stars of the sky and sands of the sea, and they would be without number. They literally could not be counted. It's an impossibility. And in this action, David reminds me of a man who keeps counting his money because he's so proud of how much he's been able to acquire or accumulate. It speaks of his greatness in the earth, but not of God's. If it was of God's, there would be a trust knowing that how many other people are here that God will provide, just like he did with the loaves and the fishes in the New Testament. So there's a deeper meaning here as well. In our lifetime, counting the people has become imperative to the world government. When I was a child, not everybody even had a birth certificate. Today, Everyone and everybody and everything is numbered and identified. We have the internet of all things, smart cities for continued surveillance. I suspect one of the reasons that counting the people is so offensive to God is that this is a picture of the devil's in game. If he can prove that we have an overpopulation of people, then we can try to control how many people are born by abortion, by starving people out, or any other means that the enemy decides to do. How can anyone know that there's a need for population control if nobody's counting? No wonder this was the devil's idea. And he started all the way back with King David. In our modern world, Everything about us is numbered. You have a social security number. You have a driver's license number. You have an automobile license number. You have a VIN number on every vehicle. Your computer has a number. Your camera, your contact lenses, everything. You name it, everything has a number. You are no longer an individual. You have become a number. God desires that you are uniquely created in his image, but the devil does everything that he can to make you and I forget that. In the beginning, I alluded to something that had happened that opened David up to the suggestions of the devil, so we're going to go there now. Here it is. And this is to be a warning to all of God's people who dabble with the things of the enemy, no matter how beautiful or how prosperous it makes us. We take a scripture that says that God has taken the wealth of the ungodly and laid it up for the just. And we try to make it a justification for us acquiring things that we don't necessarily need or that will be our demise. In First Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, and the C.J. Bede, it reads this. In the spring, at the time when kings go out to war, Joab led the army out in force, and he laid waste the country of the people of Ammon. Then he came, and he laid siege against Rabbah. That's R-A-B-B-A-H. But David stayed in Jerusalem. David didn't even go to the battle. He's an older man. While Joab attacked Rabat, and he destroyed it. Verse 2. David took the crown, so David goes out to get the spoils. He didn't go to war, but he went out to get the spoils. David took the crown of Malcolm's, off Malcolm's head, and he found it to weigh 66 pounds with its gold and precious stones, and it was placed on David's head. He carried off great quantities of spoil from the city. This word Malcolm, M-A-L-K-A-M, is another name for Molech. 
Molech is Satan. All these other gods that are named, you name them, their, their origin is Satan. They're just disguised by a different name for a different territory or maybe a principality. So he takes the crown of Molech and puts it on his head. This reads that the crown that was on another god's head was placed on David's head. The god of Moloch wore a crown. You can see that in his pictures. This weighed between 66 and 75 pounds. Do you think a human could wear that much weight on his head for very long? King Charles of England, his crown weighs five pounds. The queen's weighs 2.5 pounds. Do you think this was on an earthly king? Psalms 21 tells us, the Lord, the king, will delight in your strength and your salvation. How greatly will he rejoice? You have given him his heart's desire. David's talking about himself. God has given him his heart's desire. And you have not withheld the request of his lips. Stop and think about that. Selah. For you meet him with blessings of good things. You have set a crown of pure gold upon his head. David already had a crown of pure gold set on his head. And we're talking about dealing with idols are things that were attached to idols or came out of a pagan nation that have not been sanctified to God. When Rachel, Jacob's wife, took her father's idols, it cost her her life, for those of you that know that story. This is what it tells us in Deuteronomy 12, 2 through 4. It tells us to destroy the things that belong to other gods. You shall utterly destroy all their places wherein the nations which you shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. And you shall overthrow their altars, altar of Molech with a crown, and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. And you shall hewn down the graven images of their God. That image was supposed to be hewn down and destroy the name of them out of that place. Well, the G&T says it this way. The Ammonite idol Molech, calls it exactly what it is, had a gold crown which weighed about 75 pounds. In it, there was a jewel which David took and put in his own crown. He also took a large amount of loot from the city. That's how it was rendered in the G&T. Let's look what see King James says. And David took the crown of their king from off his head, which I doubt that this was on a king's head. And he found that it weighed a talent of gold. A talent is 75 pounds. And there were precious stones in it. And it was set on David's head. And he brought also exceeding much spoil out of the city. David is bringing all of this loot, the stuff from pagan gods, and bringing it into the palace and into Jerusalem. David brought cursed things into Jerusalem and into his palace. He coveted it, something dedicated to an idol. And when he took loot in the battles that he used ultimately for the temple, because he did do that, he didn't keep it for himself, but he dedicated it to God. He didn't place it on his head or put it on his body. He dedicated those things to God. So the Geneva Bible says this in 1 Chronicles 20, verse 2. And then David took the crown of the king from off his head, and he found that it weighed a talent of gold with precious stones in it, and it was set on David's head. And he brought away the spoil of the city exceedingly much. So whichever it is, none of it's good. David took the crown of an idol that burned babies alive and put it on his own head. What was he thinking? Or maybe, maybe he took the crown of the king and put it on his own head. But when you look this up 
in the Strong's Concordance, it really looks like he took the crown of Moloch. The God had placed that on his own head. What king has a crown that weighs 75 pounds? But when you look at the pictures of the statues of Moloch, you can see easy that his crown will weigh 75 pounds. So the king of Ammon was a representation of his God, Moloch. But even if David took a stone out of it and placed it in his own crown, because it was so large and amazing, did any of that have anything to do with the devil's ability to stand up against Israel and cause David to count the people? Did it? Tell me what you think. Put it in the comments. Did this crown of Satan, Molech, who is Satan, open the thought life of David up to the enemy? He wasn't able to cast down this imagination. He wasn't able to get rid of this thought. Even though Joab and all of his officers tried to talk about it, but he couldn't get rid of it. It was like he was obsessed with it. Where did that thought come from? Did what David placed on his head affect his thought life in any way? Did it cause his ego or his pride to increase? When he placed that crown on his head, did he open his thought life up to the enemy to be tempted? God is not a tempter, but Satan is. This sin costs the lives of 70,000 people. How many lives have been taken because of the sins of our leaders in our land and others? What about worldwide? So here's the warning that I feel that I'm to bring with this teaching. If an object that is greatly to be desired, you look upon it, it's just gorgeous, you just got to have it. Can it bring you compromise? Can it affect you the way that it affected David? The, uh, the man after God's own heart. If it can affect David that, what about you? What about that thing you've always wanted and you can't wait to get when you get it, it loses its luster? It doesn't have the effect you thought it would. It doesn't bring you the joy and the happiness that you thought it would. What can it do to you or for you? Chapter 20 of 1 Chronicles only has eight verses. This is a really short chapter. It doesn't seem like it's even connected to anything else in the story that's presented here. But if there were not chapter divisions, we would see that it's just as soon as David places the ungodly crown on his head that Satan stood up against him and all of Israel has to be counted. And David became puffed up. And the Amplified tells us that he took the senses out of pride. It tells us that. We can look back at the story of Achan. If you remember, Joshua goes in to overcome Jericho in the very next battle. They lose. Because Achan, one of his warriors, takes an idol. It's called an accursed thing. And he puts it in his tent. And it causes Israel to lose the next battle. And 36 men lose their lives and they run with their tails between their legs from the enemy that they just overthrew. This is in Joshua 7. David took an accursed thing into his palace and even placed it on his head. As I said in the beginning... We don't always get the details within the scriptures. But if we read the word in context and ignore the chapters and verses, we can better see the cause and the effect of many things. Why did God put this in the word if it wasn't important? Why did we need to know about this crown? Why did we need to know that David put it on his head? He could have gone out and got the loot and brought that stuff back and we didn't ever known it. But God chose to put that in the word. We're coming up on a worldly pagan holiday. Do not partake of the kingdom of darkness. What seems innocent to you now may cost you in the long run. Please pray about whatever you bring into your home. Someone told me the other day that they were in Walmart and there were witches in Walmart laying hands on all the candy, and praying curses over the candy. And then we go in there and buy it. 
and we deal that out to our kids and spread it throughout the world. Anything that comes into my home, no matter where I purchase it, I pray over it. I break curses and I cover it with the blood of Jesus. I pray over the dust that settled on it. I pray over germs that might have touched it. And I wash everything before I wear it or use it. I used to be, when I was a young woman, an inspector in a blue jean factory. And man, those, those jeans went from person to person to person to person. And when it got to me, and you talk about being infected, it had every germ on it you could imagine that was going around. I know those things, when they're inspected, you can't see the invisible, the things that the devil wants to use against you. Be mindful of what you put on your head, what you put in your head, of what you place before your eyes, of what you listen to. Protect this precious space. This is the temple of God on earth. Learn from David's mistakes. Be wise. Love God. And get your desires under control. You don't have to have the best. You don't have to feed your ego or stroke your ego for any reason. God is a great provider. He will give us the things that we need to have. We don't have to have the biggest or the heaviest crown. We don't have to have the biggest or the most amazing stone placed in that crown. Jesus said that we are stars and stones in his crown. Tell me, what you think. Is this far-fetched or does this make sense to you? I appreciate you leaving a comment. Please give us a like, a share, and a thumbs up. I think that this was a profound teaching. I've never seen this. I've never heard it taught before, but it's in the word for a reason. Why did God want us to know that David took a crown of an idol? a huge idol, 75 pound crown, and place it on his own head. God have mercy. Father, give us wisdom as we move through these next days. Give us wisdom for our government, for our election, for our families, and for our children. And may you bless every one of those that took the time to listen. We love you, and we thank you for tuning in. God bless you. See you next time. Sorry.